Welcome everyone. Fernando and I are here to start another series looking at an ancient text. This time we're going to be analyzing and discussing the illustrious Brihat Parashara Horashastra, perhaps the most famous text today in Indian astrology, um, and certainly one of the most controversial as well, perhaps next to Jaimini Sutras. Uh, we're really excited to be here and to bring you, you know, some sort of commentary on this text. You know, love it, hate it, take it, leave it, whatever. We're going to do our best. Who, as... who hates it? Who hates it? Oh, what no, I mean our commentary. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean our oh, commentary, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, we're, we're, two, we're two dudes not from India who love Indian astrology and yeah, metaphysics yeah. and culture. And we're going to do our best to, like, you know, honor all of that stuff as we discuss Definitely. it and talk about it. And... Um, you know, I'd just like to thank Fernando because he initiated this and it was his idea and it, we, you know, we had a lot of fun doing Yavana Jataka and I think, I think we're going to have even more fun doing Man, I, yeah. Yeah. By the way, nice to see you. And, and as I was telling you before we record, we started recording, you know, uh, when I was reading the book to, to, for preparation for, for this meeting, you know, I was really pumped because, cool. um, This is, as I told you, this is like the third time I go into the book. I haven't read it completely because let's be honest, you know, when you go to the descriptions of, you know, like the Baba Yogas or maybe the, the part of the Dashas, you don't read them all. I mean, I mean, you could read them, but, you know, that's something yeah. that we're going to do now. And I'm really pumped because uh, it's, it's incredible, in my opinion, that no one has really done this before on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Obviously, nobody has, has ever um, analyzed Yamanayadag as we did. But nobody has really done Brihat uh, Parashara Horashastra, which is uh, um, a more famous book than Yavanayadaga. Much more famous, yeah. And, and let, me, let me say, you know, my teacher, Ryan, Ryan Kursak, did some videos on the chapters on Parashara, but he didn't do them all. And it's really interesting because, you know, people continuously, all of the time in Yotish, you know, talk about Brihat Parashara Horashastra this, Brihat Parashara yeah. Horashastra that. But, I mean, they don't really go into the book. They don't really go into what it means. They don't really go into Parasha. They really don't know, go into the history yeah. of the book. And not only that, you know, I remember one, once K.N. Rao saying in one of his books, you know, it's either Jogi's Destinies and the Wheel of Time or Astrology, Destiny and the Wheel of Time. One of these books, I don't remember. Sure. I remember he, he said that, uh, and in, in the quote, you know, goes like this. He said that, you know, people love to quote Parashara, but they seldom quote Parashara's remedies, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that, sure. that goes to say that a lot of people just uh, mention Brihat Parashara Horashastra as a passing note, as a cliche, as a soundbite, just yeah. like people yeah. might do that with other disciplines. I mean, like, Like, I don't know, you, you study philosophy and you mention the cards or you mention Plato, but you really don't talk about what they wrote, uh, you know, you, you, or even a more mundane subject. You talk about, I don't know, um, ba uh, basketball and you talk about, I don't know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or you talk, but you don't know about what he did. Or yeah, sure. You're yeah. just kind of like name dropping, like yeah, my man it, Plato, exactly. my man Socrates. <laughs> exactly. Man name Sh dropping. Shankara. Yeah. No, no. And then, and then you have these, like us, Westerners who dress yeah. up like Indians and, 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 and then they pronounce the Sanskrit. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a Spanish speaking uh, yeah. person, so, so it's easier for me. To, you know, like saying, "Well, you know, in chapter six of Brihat Parashara Horashastra." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, lo I, love, Maharishi, I love doing that. Maharishi Parashara wrote, and I it, quote, "You know, it's, it's, it's like, like when I used to uh, when I used to talk about this famous guitar piece from Spain. Like, I wouldn't. I wanted yeah, to always uh, pronounce uh, it. I'd be like, Con the, Concierto de Aranjuez. Aranjuez the Concierto right? de Aranjuez. <laughs> like, you know, you have to say Concierto de Aranjuez. Like, you can't just be like, the Concierto de Aranjuez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, like, it just doesn't have the same, yeah, gusto. And, so, yeah, not chakras and, like, shotri de sha. You know, like, you have to, you have to, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. English is the, is the global tongue today. So, you know, it's okay. Who cares? But, but I mean, it's just name dropping, man. And, and people just, just for example, just, just to start off, let's just start off. The first thing, Brihat Parashara Horashastra. Parashara Horashastra, Parashara Brihat, 
BPHS. Yeah. What does it mean, man? It's simple. And, and I used to do this in my conferences. You just take the words. Brihat means large, great. Parashara is obviously the Maharishi that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Hora. Hora is a skanda of Yotisha. Okay? And this is describing Parashara. This is also describing Prashnamarga. And, and, and Hora is basically a skanda. It's basically a, a division of the three divisions of, of astrology, which is Ganita, uh, or, or they also call it Sami, uh, uh, Siddhanta, I'm sorry. Uh, it's Ganita, Samita, and Hora, right? Okay. Uh, Ganita is astronomical uh, mathematics. Oh, and, yes, right. Uh, which is composed of Gola, which is like visual, uh, a, a, a visual uh, astronomy of, you know, the ecliptic, the planets and all that, whatever. Cool. Simple stuff that you don't need mathematics. Ganita is more mathematical. And then you have Samita, which is basically the omens, omenology, and also like how they're cataloged and all that. And okay. then you have Hora. And people confuse Hora with Yataka. Hora is basically horoscopic astrology. Hora, I mean, Yataka is natal astrology, as Muhurta is electional astrology and um, Prajna. Electional, is... exactly. Okay. So, so, and Shastra is like scripture or, scripture. or manual. Yeah. So, what you have here. Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, what it means is the great treatise on horoscopic astrology by Parashara. Okay, so that's, cool. That's, great. That's the yeah. title of, of the whole book. And, and, you know, that's something that I've never heard anyone say. I mean, probably people people say it. I mean, but but in, in YouTube per se, I've never really sure. heard someone say that. You know, it's basically Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra means the great treatise on horoscopic astrology by Parashara. So yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, great. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, even I had forgotten what Brihat meant, you know. Oh no, I looked it up in the internet. So don't don't okay. think I'm, you know. Yeah, and uh, there I'm, are I'm several not a Sanskrit other... scholar or anything. I'm not here with Amala, you know, pretending I know everything that you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I think so. Yeah, why don't we talk about um now that we've like really introduced the title and stuff, why don't we just talk about like sort of the composition and like the or the historical or whatever well yeah i mean the kind of general ideas of, yeah and uh i've got i've got mine here as well i've got the other volume in the other room but this is the santanam translation which is yeah. a very good translation according to a friend of mine in india so i'm, I'm happy to be using it and um anyway uh this book is like I think as from what I understand, we can date it to about the um, the eighth century or so, right? Seventh, seventh, okay. eighth. According to what I've researched from the seventh to the eighth century, people say the first part, well, by the way, it's just two volumes, but it's not necessarily two volumes. It's that it's divided into two volumes. Uh, and yeah, some people yeah. say it's that not the volumes. first volume is from the seventh century and people, some people say that the second one is from the eighth century, right? Okay. Uh, but really, we don't know. It's basically, let's put it circa seventh, eighth century. However, you know, here and here we start with the dilemma about the historical Brihat Parashara Shastra and the religious Brihat Parashara. The mythological, yeah. Because, yeah. like, could Sage Parashara really have written this? Or Maitreya really have dictated it from his teacher Parashara? Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to say yes or no. I, I'm going to say that there's a ton of material in here that is in Yavana Jataka and that is clearly a development on Yavana Jataka, right? So it's not a lot of the stuff in here and even Varahara Mira as well. So a lot of the stuff in here is not like, is not original in that Or, or, or that old. old. Yeah. 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 Um, I personally think it's more like, it's more similar to um, it's like a mix between a platonic dialogue where Plato was, was pretending, was writing as though he was Socrates. He was basically writing down Socrates' teachings in a dialogue form. And so all of Plato's works are Socrates' teachings, theoretically. But it's even more removed, and it kind of reminds me of how you had all these grimoires and all these texts in like the Islamic empire and medieval Europe that were like, Oh, the key of Solomon and the lesser key of Solomon. Yeah. Solomon didn't write those. And Solomon is a sage in the Hebrew tradition, in my opinion, a high sage and King. 
So, you know, it's not like Solomon wrote those books and it's not like Aristotle wrote the book of Aristotle, which, which was attributed to Mashallah, but now apparently there's some new stuff. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that interview. The different yeah, yeah. author potentially, I forget who, but the point is, is like Aristotle didn't write that, you know? Like, and, and Mashallah, whoever wrote it, didn't even know Aristotle. But there are these, do um, you call this pseudo, pseudo, pseudo epigrapha. Epigrapha, yeah, pseudo epigrapha. What a great word. Yeah, right. It's so, so to me, it's more likely that it's that. Now, that does, does that mean that, like, it's not a very profound book? Absolutely not. It is a profound book. Like, and a sage could have written it. Or if not a sage, at least a very, very skilled astrologer or set of astrologers wrote this book you know so it's not something to be you know it's not i'm not trying to diminish it by suggesting these things but i these are the questions i have posed so anyway yeah yeah, yeah. i mean and this is a, a problem we're going to see with a lot of these vedic books you know because historically you know we and, and this is not like a western thing but historically we can uh, date these texts to the uh, to the seventh eighth century AD AD, which is basically you know six hundred or seven hundred after the birth of Christ. However, people say that th this text uh, is basically from three thousand BC, from from the time of the Mahabharata. Th that's that's what most people will. Um, uh, say in terms of, of the religious context <laughs> I don't, uh, because, yeah. because just flow with it Lars and because because the idea is that that Parashara lived in the time of, of these of the events sure. of the Mahabharata which some people say it's about 3000 BC and and you know and also there's other people who say that this is ancient knowledge and that the most recent transcription will happen 3000 uh, BC, 3000 BC, right? And then it got recompiled now for, for Kali sure. Yuga in the 7th, 8th century. Uh, but, you know, in terms of dating, you know, th we're going to have a lot of uh, situations where people are just going to say different dates, which is something that usually happens with Vedic texts, principally because of religious uh, precepts, because, of, of sure. because the difference of, of between faith and you know academic research but i mean people say that 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 brihad parashara horashastra is basically from the time of the mahabharata because of some alignments he says in the books that that goes in par with the uh war of the mahabharata which i for, i'm sorry kurukshetra the, uh, 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 yeah, the, the what was the the family of Arjuna? Pandavas. And yeah, the Pandus, the Pand, the war between those family members. Yeah. So in a way, you know, we know it's from the seventh eighth century, but some people say it's like from three thousand BC. Okay. From the Mahabharata, uh, and and at the same time, you know, people might say that that's just basically their recompilation of something that's much older. So, okay. um, in, in terms of chronology. I think we can just safely say it's from the 7th, 8th century. And it was written by Parashara or it was written by someone who claimed to be Parashara. But yeah. who is this Parashara, right? You know, before we, we, we move on, yeah, I mean, sure. who is this Parashara? And, and he's basically a Maharishi, which yeah. is basically Maha, great, Rishi, sage, a great yeah. sage. And and his, his, his ancestry is really interesting. You know, uh, Parashara is the, the son of Sakti, Maharishi, who at the same time is the son of Bashishta. Bashishta was a Sapta Rishi, was one of the seven great Rishis of Vedic, uh, of Vedic thought, right? Yeah, one of the, okay. the, and he was Parashara's grandfather. So we see from this uh, genealogy that he has like uh, a very important genealogy, which is called the Adavarta Guru Parampara. Which is, which is a type of lineage that a lot of people in India use to justify their parampara, right? You know, th there's a lot of debate in respect to that. You know, the idea also of, of pseudo-epigraph, well, it's not pseudo-epigraph, but the idea of having a, like, let's say a pseudo uh, parampara, the idea that you can connect yourself to like the teachings directly from, from Manu to one of these paramparas. A lot of people say these lineages have been broken a lot of people say that they really don't exist. So other people swear by them. 
but sure. you know we can't really say if they exist or don't but the idea here is the Vashishta was a Saptarichi and then he had uh, Sakti Maharishi and then he had Parashara and Parashara was the father of Veda Vyasa who was the transcriber of the Mahabharata of oh, so, Vyasa Vyasa yeah 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 yeah, and, and you see, he, here we have more or less um, the idea of who this Parashra was. And in terms of what we know from his biography, from myth or from history, whatever you want to call it, is that Parashra was raised uh, by his grandfather, the Saptarishi, uh, Vashishta, because his father, um, Sakti Maharishi, <laughs> was killed when he was young. He apparently got eaten by a Rushaka, by a demon. <laughs> okay, okay. So, I mean, which is quite interesting. So he got raised by a Saptarishi, which is, you know, that's a mouthful, you know, the idea of, of being raised by one of the most wisest people in the earth. And yeah. Parashara also wrote other texts besides we have Parashara Horashastra. He wrote uh, Riksa Yurveda, which is uh, a treatise on trees and botany. He also wrote Parashana Dharma Samhita, which is basically a code of laws for the Kali Yuga. And he also wrote Krishi Parasharam, which is also a treatise on agriculture and weeds. Okay? Wow. Okay. And, and, he also, and he also wrote the Vishnu Purana. So we're talking about a person who is prolific in, in yeah. writing. Wow. And, sure. you know, he wrote about agriculture and weeds. So he, he loved those weeds. And agriculture uh, and it's really interesting because usually you only associate Parashara to astrology but we can see here that he's also associated to medicines to trees to agriculture and to uh, Apurana and once again as you said you know Parashara might be a pseudepigrapha we don't know especially in this context maybe as you as as everybody knows Vedic tradition is an oral tradition mainly yeah. And, and written down, you know, some people say it started being written down for this Kali Yuga, but the idea is that we really don't know where Brihat Parashara Harashastra came from. Yeah. And, and nobody really knows when Parashara lived. Some people might, might and, and even some people question the dating of the Mahabharata. And, and you know, th this, is, this is something that has to ta be taken in mind. And yeah. also, you know, this is the lineage of him but it says in Parashara that um, Parashara learned astrology from a rishi called Saunaka, okay? Which, which is the, the guru, the, the Jyotish guru for Parashara was Saunaka. And at the same time, Saunaka, um, I'm sorry, I wrote this down. Uh, it, and it's basically, you know, uh, Parashara in the first chapters talks about his lineage and he talks about like Brahma Pita Maha gave the teachings of Yotish to Narada and Narada gave it to uh, Saunaka and Saunaka taught it to Parashara and Parashara sure. is teaching it to Maitreya. For those who don't know, we had Parashara Horashastra, as Lars mentioned, is basically a dialogue between Maitreya, which is also a, who is also a sage with Parashara. Yeah, and uh, it goes with the line of these ancient, uh, well, not that ancient, but old Hellenistic texts of dialogues, which uh, Plato wrote uh, a lot. We can cite maybe the um, the uh, Republic. Republic, sure. Yeah, for yeah. and 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 another problem with Brihat Parashara Harshastra is that this text was lost. Yeah, for it was a lost long right. time. And recompiled you know, and, in the 19th century, right? Yes. Well, some people, that's the thing. I was doing the research and it says here that some people say it's the 19th century uh, and other people say it's the 18th century. And, and, no, okay. and, and I kind of didn't find out who well, was the one who recompiled it. Um, yeah. Well, let, let me, yeah, let me mention something. I had a, a conversation, uh, an illuminating conversation with uh, Dr. Andrew Foss at the, Sedona Vedic Astrology Conference a couple years ago, and uh, I was being kind of a, a little shit uh, at the time, and uh, I later a little shit you yeah, you I was never being do a shit. That. Yeah, I later apologized to him, um, and I and and so I just want to say like I have a lot of respect for Dr. Foss. Oh, definitely. And for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Foss is the creator 
of of uh, Yoti Star. Yeah. And he wrote this book, which is amazing. I'm just going to share it and plug it for him. Cool. This book about mantras. Oh, cool. Yeah, I saw he was selling that there. Oh, oh, yeah. it's amazing, especially if cool. you do traditional sidereal astrology. This is our per cool. these are personalized mantras for pers for for specific positions in the sidereal system. So wow. there you go. Wow. There you I'll go. have to look at that. My friend bought it, so I'll have to take another look at it. Then. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, he was saying that his guru in India uh, was from a line of Jodishis that basically like used to memorize the entire Brihad Parashara Hora Shastra and that it, the original was 108 chapters and that it it's something that they still have, but they haven't released to the public supposedly okay so now i don't know if this is 100 percent true or not but it's it's i i would be willing to believe it um because i don't think that the parashara or shastra we have today is the full text and even the complete or real text in every way shape and form there are some shlokas in here that are very out of place there yeah. are there are badly translated jaimini sutras in here, yeah meaning that like Ernst has talked about this because Ernst did a ton of work translating Jaimini. And I think it's, he did some very excellent work translating Jaimini. And what he says is that basically like Jaimini is coded Sanskrit, which means that when you translate it, there's like hidden numbers and things. Yeah. That that's that's the problem with Jaimini. It's, it's yeah. just code and everybody right. decodes it in a different way and everybody interprets yeah. that code in a different way. And then everybody uh, applies that theory in different ways and right. people can learn Jaimini from three different schools and it's going to be three different astrologers. Yes, and and I don't really have a major problem with that because Jaimini is very mystical and multi-layered. When, when I read Jaimini, I feel like it's more akin to something like the Mahabharata because I've read some of the Mahabharata. And uh, whereas Parashara, this text seems like any any other astrological text to me in many respects which is not to diminish it but it just doesn't have that mystical depth that jaimini has in my experience now what i'm going to say is that the chapters the jaimini chapters in this they are a reproduction of the chapters in jaimini on the same things but they're not written in coded sanskrit yes exactly they're so the way ernst put it is like somebody's bad translation of jaimini's sanskrit into non-coded sanskrit is like what you have in this book. And so like, why is it in this recompilation? We don't know. It's very questionable. And, and that does, and don't get me wrong though, those chapters are very valuable. Like those sutra, those shlokas are very useful. You know, in a way I'm glad they're in here, but you know, they, I don't know that they belong in here. And, you know, let me just also say that like, you know, while I do think this is pseudo, Pseudo, what, how did you say it? Pseudo 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 epigrapha. Pseudo epigrapha. Pseudo epigrapha. Pseudo pseudo in, in English, it's pseudo epigrapha. Pseudo epigraphia or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's the thing. It's Spanish, it's, it's, right? It's, it's, okay. It, well, well, it's a Latin. Uh, or Latin, yeah. yeah easier to pronounce it. And again, that doesn't make it not a good book. Like, But I think there's a problem with people thinking that older is better um and that's just simply not true like i once had a conversation with somebody and they were like saying that you know vasya is like far superior to like sri arabindo and it's like because why because vasya is older like it just they're just they just didn't have an argument you know because i because you know whether you whatever you think it doesn't matter like the point is is like we do have modern day sages like Sri Aurobindo writing epic poetry like Savitri, which is an incredible poem written in English by a sage, a modern sage, right? And to say that somehow that's like less authentic because it's not as old, that's ridiculous. And there is a there is a term for people who think that way. I forget what it is, but it's a logical fallacy. Purist? Purist? No, no, there's like a logic term for people who think like that. It's a, okay. it's a logical fallacy. And so basically... What I'm trying to say is like, it doesn't matter if this book is from the time of Vasya. It doesn't matter if this book was written 50 years ago. All that matters is how accurate and useful the information contained therein yeah. is. And this is a treasure chest of, of astrological techniques and, and insights and all kinds of things. So I don't care how old it is or who wrote it, if it was some high mucky muck sage, or if it was just some Jodashi who like lived in some hut 
in some village that uh, didn't nobody knew of and like wrote this whole, I don't care. Like I, all I care is the utility of what I find in here and in any text. And I think that's how we should, we should be approaching all of this stuff, you know? So I'm not going to say, oh, this, this definitely is pseudo epigrapha. I'm not going to say that it's uh, definitely 3000, 5000, 6000 years old. Like I'm, I'm not going to take a, a firm stance on it. Like I do have my, my, I do have my opinion currently, but I'm not married to it. If something else comes out that like proves to me that this text is older than Yavana Jataka, older than Varaha Ramirez text and things like that. Cool. I'm not attached, you know, like I just want the truth, but I think people are very confused about what this is. This is not Veda and Veda Correct. means that which is heard, right? This is not a sacred text. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. Like, I don't know of any astrology well, well, text that is. This is not the, a sacred text. The, the, the thing is that- It's a the, great text. The, the, the error came when astrologers in the 70s and 80s in English speaking countries decided to call Yotisha or Yotish Vedic astrology. That's, that's where yeah. the problem starts. Yeah. Because, you know, Vedic astrology is, is not Vedic astrology. Vedic astrology is Yotisha and Yotisha is Yotish and that's it. Yeah. You know, ca calling Yotisha Vedic astrology is like calling Western astrology biblical astrology. Yeah, it would be the and, same thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, there is astrology in the Bible, but it's not defined by astrology at the same time. Yeah, or like Quranic astrology. Like there's exactly there's and, mentions and the, of astrology yeah. in the Quran. But yeah. there's no like Quranic astrology. Yeah, yeah and, and, and the problem comes stems from that idea. You know, astrology of India is not necessarily astrology of the Vedas. There yeah. is astrology in the Vedas, of yeah. course, but it's not like the most defining thing. And at the same time, Yotish is one of the six uh, of Vedangas, and it's the last one. It's the last one you learn. And, you know, taking into consideration what you just say, I just want to add to it. Sure. You know, this text was lost for centuries. And in the 10th century AD, you know, 900 years ago, supposedly, more or less 100 or 200 years after Parashar was written, there was an astrologer called uh, Batotpala. And Batotpala mentions all of the treatises of astrology until that time, right? And he mentions Brihad Parashar Horashastra, but he says he has never, ever read it. He's just heard about it. So wow. we see... That in the 10th century, Parashara was known to astrologers in India, but he, he really didn't know about it. I mean, he had never wow. seen it. Wow. So it, it's just 200 years since it supposedly was written and it was lost. So maybe it was just memorized in oral tradition. Maybe it was so old that people just, it was hidden away, you know. But the idea is that, that we have that. And it wasn't until the 18th, 19th century I don't know who did this, and I don't know the specific date, but it was until then when a pundit, and I don't know who this man is, uh, he went all around India, and he recompiled Brihad Prashara Horashastra. Oh, wow. And, that, and that's the version we have today, right? So we have a text that we don't know who wrote. We don't know when it was yeah. written. We have uh, historical references to it. And, you know, 1,000 years ago, you know, the 10th century AD, 1,000 years ago, people didn't know where this book was. Uh, there's people who say that it was retained orally. There are people who say that the oral tradition in India was destroyed with the English colonization and probably with the Mughal invasion also. You know, and, and, and there's a lot of contradictory things going on. And I just want to add to what you said. You know, there's another thing that, um, you know, Sanskrit scholars say that Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra it's written in a much newer form of Sanskrit than an older one, which, yeah. uh, uh, which, which gives the idea that this is a more recent text. It's not Vedic Sanskrit, basically. Exactly. That's what I mean. And not only that, and thank you for mentioning that, Lars, this is Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, which means, as I said, it's the great treatise on horoscopic astrology by Parashara. Yeah. And as we've mentioned before, horoscopic astrology is not the same as Vedic Yotisha. No. Vedic no. Yotisha is, is basically more or less like a spiritual electional astrology for Vedic sacrifices, Vedic rituals, Vedic uh, uh, things, right? right? And horoscopic astrology, uh, some people might not like to hear this, but it's more of a 
Hellenistic invention, or at least a more of a, you know, Mediterranean invention of the second century BC onwards. So basically we have here a Yotish text that is a treatise on horoscopic astrology. And as we've mentioned before, the oldest known Yotish text in, uh, in India is the Javanayataka, which stems from the second or third century AD, yeah. which is or the sixth, uh, the seventh, eighth century, which when is when supposedly this book was written. So you know, if we follow the chronology, you know, Brihat Parashara Horashastra is basically an extrapolation, uh, something that was built upon Yamanayataka and maybe other books that we don't know or haven't discovered, which at the same time mixes up Hellenistic principles with native Yotish principles, mostly maybe the nakshatras. Uh, mostly the way you measure um, the moon's faces with the titis and the karanas, yeah. uh, the panchangas and all that. And, and that's something you have to take in mind. And as you said, you know, people memorize these books. People in India today memorize the Mahabharata, the Gita. Um, and... I don't know if anyone memorizes the whole oh, Mahabharata. Yeah, yeah. I've seen videos. Really? <laughs> and it's like four hours long. Yeah. But yeah, the whole Mahabharata yeah. is or like... The, or the Gita, I mean... Or, or the maybe Gita. the Gita. Yeah, because the entire Mahabharata is much more than just that war. Yeah, and it's actually the not, longest I wouldn't poem say. in history. It's, it's like four times as long as the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. Yeah, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if people have, have memorized that. Because okay. it's, we've become so dumb that we haven't been able to, to wow. maximize our mind. But yeah, but at the same time... Uh, Lars, this is a very normal tradition in, in, in most Asian countries still. People memorize the Quran still. People That's, memorize yeah, okay. Pe That's people, true. And, and this is, this is the thing about Yotish and about uh, the, the astrological tradition of India. It is an oral tradition. And this is why some people might say that, you know, we have some secret chapters about Parasha, which is a probability, right? But we don't know if it's the authentic chapters or if, or if it's, it's written down even um or, or if it's something that was well, developed uh, further and, on and then another thing i wanted to say too now that we're on this topic is that and not only that and let me let me finish yeah, go that. ahead go and, ahead and as you said you know the idea of older is better than new it's not a quite as you said correctly it's not a question about you know older is better newer is worse it's not about that it's not about time it's not about chronology it's about perspective and this is my opinion right you know, it's not about something being old or new. It's about something with a certain perspective or another perspective. Is it written with a traditional perspective where, you know, uh, the precepts are, you know, transcendence, God, the center of everything is the idea of human beings trying to transcend to another level in, in, in a traditional way through ascesis, through, through aphesis, through, through moksha, through through hero actions, through sacrifice, and so on? Or is it a modern context sure. where evolution is involved, where the idea of progress is involved, where the idea of linear time is involved, where the idea of economy is involved, where the idea sure. of marketing is involved? You know, th this is something that people have to take in mind about the differences between traditional astrology, modern astrology, and in a sense, the differences between, you know, traditionalism and modernity, and it's obviously perspective rather than just, you know, chronology. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, great, great. Well said. So, yeah, a mutual friend of ours in India, you know, has an oral lineage through his family that's pretty old of astrologers, mm -hmm. right? And when he was learning, he revealed that he didn't even, his, his grandfather didn't even let him read Parashara or any books. And in fact, like, they do things a bit differently than we're going to find in Parashara. Yeah. And, you know, but there's, there has been kind of a movement in recent years and I don't know, it could be more from the West. It could be a mixture of Indians and Westerners. I'm not sure where it originates, but this idea that like, if it's in this book, it must be real. But if it's just in an oral tradition, they must have misunderstood the book or they must have like erroneously changed something. And that to me couldn't be further from the truth. Like this is it's, it's, one, it's a gray area. Exactly. This it's is one area. perspective on astrology. This is, I'm, and I'm going to say it again, it's one perspective. Raha Amira tells us to do many different things than this book. Um, Parashara. 
Yeah, no, Varaha Amira, who, who's, who's uh, not, not, sorry, Varaha Amira, who's another great astrologer. Yeah, yeah, Brihat Yataka, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he tells us to do many things different from what are said in this book. And yes. same with Yavana Jataka, right? And you'll find the same thing in the Hellenistic texts and stuff. There are differences of yes. opinion and practice. So if somebody has an oral tradition and they are really, you know, capable of reading charts, just because they do things differently than it says in like this book or another book, that shouldn't be looked down upon as like, you know, a failure or misunderstanding. This was never the quote unquote Bible of Indian astrology until the modern. Very recently. Very 20th, recently. 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. 20th century, probably late 20th century. So like, you know, and, there's and, this. And, and, and no. also the, the idea of being the Bible of Vedic astrology is just a modern label to yeah, sell these books. It is. And it's the same way people think that Ptolemy's text, Tetra Biblos, is like the exactly. foundational text of Western astrology. According to who? It's well, a it, it, well, text. Well, 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 the thing with Tetra Biblos, it's, it's that the church used it because it used the Aristotelian system to explain astrology and it okay. kind of made it fit. So, so I mean, that's more of a historical thing, but, but we have okay. pressure on orchestra is a modern it's a it's a modern uh, uh, thing it's a modern thing that that we just came about in the last hundred years yeah and and let's be honest here you know uh this this is a gray area because when you're a neophyte and you're starting astrology you think that and this is something i am i am seeing with a lot of students through my spanish channel is that people don't realize the differences between traditional astrology, modern astrology. They don't realize the difference between traditionalism and modern. Yeah. But at the same time, they don't realize that astrology is very heterogeneous. You know, we astrology is ruled by the eighth house, sudden ups and downs, breaks. It's basically, you know, disruptive things. You know, as you said, Brihad Jataka is going to be a little different. Javana Jataka is going to be different. We have Parashara Shastra is going to be different, Saravali, Faladipika, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, but at yeah, the yeah. same time, you know, you can go to the internet today. You're going to see us talking. You're going to see other people talking about the same thing in a different way. You're going to see like Vedic astrologers, right. tropical Vedic astrologers who do sidereal, Babylonian astrologers, Persian astrologers, European astrologers, Mayan astrologers, Chinese astrologers, etc. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very convoluted place. So we have to take Rihat Parashara Hora Shastra. Uh, seriously, but at the same time, we can't be fanatical about it because one, this is a modern text. It's recently recompiled. We don't know where it came from. We don't know who wrote it. Uh, yeah. And people who say that they know who wrote it and when they wrote it, they basically rely on faith and religion. And that's a strong postulate. That's something to be respected. Uh, and that's the difference between you know faith and and other, you know, modes of thinking that go on with, with a more logical approach of evidence and all, all that. But, but you see, here's where science and, and faith uh, meet. And, and a lot of people are going to swear by Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra. And a lot of people are not going to swear by it. Point. And this is something that we have to take in mind. Uh, and it's a gray area, without a doubt. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well... That was a hell of an introduction. So why don't yeah, we... I mean, I mean, and this is something that most people don't talk about, Lars. I mean, and it is. And, it's good. I've I've enjoyed the conversation. And oh, I, definitely. And I let think, me tell um, you even more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Continue. Sorry. Oh, I just I think it's I think it's necessary to have before we delve into this, um, so people let, understand where we're oh, coming definitely. from. And yeah. And let me tell you something else. You know, when you start studying astrology, you you see these interviews with these Jyotishis. And they all, uh, especially from India, and they all say the same. When you start studying astrology, do not go to the classics directly, which, which kind of makes sense by what uh, our friend Ashwin you know, told us. Yeah. You know, uh, don't go to the classics because you're going to get confused. It, it is confusing, yeah. Because the explanations are just so radical, man. You know, and, and if you have something in the Dushtanas, 8, 6, 12, yeah. And you read the descriptions that Parashara gives. Yeah. I mean, man, you, you're going to, if especially if you are easily uh, impressionable, if you are... Uh, yeah, you're going to get worried. But you know what's funny is what I've noticed with like all the 
the really good Jodishis I've encountered is that like, even though the texts say that in practice, they have a much healthier relationship to interpreting houses six, eight, and 12. Oh, than, definitely. Than most Western astrologers who are practicing traditional methods, like Western astrologers practicing traditional methods in my experience. And I know a lot of these people and I respect a lot of these people, but a lot of the times they're very like, they have a very one dimensional view that like, this this house is only bad or malefic or difficult or challenging but the jodishis are typically like instead of saying like oh you're you're instead of emphasizing that like you're going to get divorced a lot if you have like the seventh lord and venus in the sixth house or something like this right because it's the house of divorce they they it's not that they won't look at that but they'll also say but this also shows the potential like to marry someone in the medical profession or like a healer or you know to marry someone in like a from like a foreign strange land Definitely. If, you know like they'll they'll go into all the layers of it instead of just focusing on they i i find they rarely focus on the negative like like us westerners tend to do and, and i've been guilty of it too guys like i have been really guilty of it but it's like it's so interesting that that mentality and for them, you know, for, for a lot of Jodishis, like you said, astrology is the eighth house, which is traditionally a very bad, malefic, scary house. And in Persian and Islamic astrology and Christian astrology, it is the ninth house, right? Because honestly, those guys did not have as good a relationship to the eighth house stuff, in my opinion, like when they talk about it. They don't seem to like have the relationship that the that the Indians do with that occult field of activity you know the six or twelve eight and four are moksha houses they're not you know eight and twelve are not just like only difficult houses they're moksha houses they deal with occult energies and stuff and so for the christian and muslim astrologers you know putting astrology in the eighth that was like unthinkable because you know the ninth is like this the house of god the house of prophecy of dreams and and things like that. Um, and so for them, you know, uh, astrology can't be in the eighth because the eighth is so, is so bad, right? I don't know. Anyway, this is just a tangent, but I just find it interesting, the different perspectives and how they arise out of the cultural context. So, And, and another thing that you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things in these books that are, are out of place, are kind of weird, and a lot of things that are interpreted in many ways by different people. And we're going to talk yeah. about that as we go along. Before we start with chapter one, I just want to okay. say something that I just read here. This is a Santanam's edition. Uh, this was uh, an Indian astrologer. He was the teacher of James Braha. Well, I mean, he, he, they had an association uh, cool. uh, who, who is an American astrologer. And he wrote these books. And he also wrote versions of Paladipika and Sarawali, if I'm not mistaken, which are really good, you know. Um, so, um, uh, Santanam says that uh, Parashara Hora, right, uh, the, the horoscopic astrology of Parashara, finds, and I'm, and I'm reading from the preface of the Santanam edition from 1984, Parashara Hora finds its translation in Bengali, Malayalam, etc. So, there's a different, uh, different translations of, of Hora Shastra, uh, when this was written other than Hindi, uh, which translations, however, have not been seen by me. I have with me the following versions. And then he says, you know, the, the different uh, texts that exist of the, of, of Brihad Parashara Harshastra before the English translation, because that's another thing people have to realize. This is a translation of a translation. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. Wow. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, you know, you can directly translate it from, I mean, let me rephrase that. This is a translation of a translation. But for people like myself, you know, who speak Spanish, there's a Brihat Parashara Horashastra in Spanish out there. Nice. Uh, translated by a Peruvian astrologer called Raman Ulladas. And that's a translation of a translation of a translation. Wow. <laughs> but this is okay. a translation of a translation, right? And maybe it's a three-way translation because it probably, you know, it was from old Sanskrit to new Sanskrit or maybe just from an oral version to a Sanskrit version to an English version. And he says that yeah. there are uh, four versions of the text in Hindi, one by Sri Benkateshwata Press Bombay, partly rendered in Hindi for a majority of shlokas. One can find Sanskrit commentary only. Two Hindi translation by Sitaramja, which is the most common one for this text. Uh, it's from Master Kalarilal Baranasi edition. Number three, Hindi translation by Devashandra Ya. 
uh, Shaukamba edition, and fourth Hindi translation by Ganesha Data, Pat Patak Takur Pasat edition. After scrutinizing critically the four manuscripts, these are all the manuscripts he uses for, for this translation, and the ones that are available to most people who do this type of translation into European tongues, uh, well, from Hindi, of course, because a lot of people will only take the English version translated into other languages, yeah. for example. After okay. scrutinizing critically the four manuscripts, I have, for reasons of more credibility, chosen the Sanskrit version uh, rendered by Sitaram Ja, which is the second one I mentioned. Okay. The Shaukamba version is almost the same as that of Kelarilar. So he's basically saying that the third and the second version I mentioned are more or less the, the same. And he okay. goes on to say that other versions that I have come across are the Tamil translation of C.G. Rayan for only 36 chapters without Sanskrit verses. So he's translated from Tamil, not from Sanskrit here. And the wow. English translation by N.N.K. Rao for only 25 chapters without the Sanskrit shlokas. Wow. So you mean, th this is... Brihat Parashala Hurashastra is a puzzle in terms of that it's a piece from here, a piece from there, a piece from here. Yeah. You know, this is a reconstruction. This is like a Frankenstein. Wow. It is, it is a good book. Don't get me wrong. And I don't mean a Frankenstein of that way. What I mean is that this is a recomp this is a recopilation, right? Maybe in Kali Yuga, for those of us who think we're in Kali Yuga, you know, oral tradition has been um has been um you know uh, perverted. Uh, and, um, you know, and mm. now we can only rely on the written word and that has its pros, its cons. And now by the grace of God, we have this book. And from here, we will build the new Yotish for the modern world. Who knows, right? Uh, you know, this is a good introduction. I don't know if you want to close. Maybe we should close and start another video for the chapter. I think so. I was thinking that you read my mind. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, okay. know, I know. I'm a mind reader. Awesome. Yeah. All right. But, but, the, but the thing is that, that, that uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, the thing is that, that as we discussed here, you know, Parashara, what we can conclude is that A, Parashara is not this emblematic, um, omnipotent book. It could be, but it, it, it's, it's, its method of coming about is very cryptic. It's very, um, it was made piece by piece. It's a very yeah. recent publication. It only has, what, 100 years per se, maybe a little bit more. Right. So, so this is something that people have to realize. The book per se is 100, 200 years old. It was recompiled in the 18th, in the 18th 19th century. And supposedly, historically, it was written in the 7th, 8th century AD. But at the same time, it, maybe it's a transcription of something that existed that when Parashar existed in 3000 BC, when the Mahabharata occurred, which was 5,000 years ago. I mean, you know, yeah. we have Parashar Horashastra is a very great book. And I think its best testament are its techniques. And yeah. It's yeah. methods of, of recompiling. And I mean, we cannot discard the idea that this is a book strongly influenced by Hellenistic astrology, as I mentioned before, specifically yeah. the things that we're going to read and specifically by the idea that it's a horoscopic treatise and horoscopic yeah. astrology in Yotisha is no, it's no older, historically verified. Uh, it's not older than three, uh, the, second, the third century A.D., and that's a and that's a cons conservative estimate, you know. Yeah. Three, three, three century, third century A.D. onwards, horoscopic astrology exists in Jyotisha. Before that, it's the mo more Vedic traditional uh, astrology, Jyotisha for ceremonies and so on. So, man, I don't know. Do you want to say anything else? I mean, no. I mean, I, I just don't want people to think that we're shitting on Brihat Parashara or Shastra. And I, I, and I also don't want people to think that we are just, you know, bowing down to it. Yeah. Because it, it, it is not a perfect text, but it's a good text. Yeah. Let's, let's be honest here. You know, this is a very good text. The techniques are amazing. Chapter three is amazing. Chapter three is like, poof, we're going to talk about that in the next video. Sure. Uh, the chapters on the dashas is amazing. Yeah. 
I mean, we I have the Baba yogas myself. Definitely. The there you Baba go. Yogas. That's one of the most amazing things I've ever read in astrology. So. And that's something that is absent in Hellenistic texts. Yeah. I, mean, I think Rhetorius tries to do it, but there's like missing pieces. And, yeah. and honestly, it's not as profound. And uh, probably, you know, Rhetorius. As much as is, I like Rhetorius. But <laughs> Rhetorius is more or less uh, contemporary with the 7th, 8th century, if I'm not mistaken. So he's a little later. Yeah, I forget exactly the year like 200 300 more or less in that time i mean yeah so it would be more or less at the time when parashara was written per se it's very so, possible man, right you know this is going to be a great adventure i'm really pumped because i mean i hope this series helps people learn more about uh parashara i i hope this series really opens up people's minds to parashara specific, specifically traditional western astrologers yeah. because man you know i came into hellenistic astrology after yotish and i feel as you've said as you mentioned you know i, I wish that people who study hellenistic astrology also studied uh yotish yeah. because i mean yotish fills in the blanks in hellenistic astrology in a in, a, in an awesome way yeah. And at the same time, Hellenistic Stroll, he fills in the blanks in Yotish in an amazing way. Definitely. Yeah. I don't even consider them two different systems. Definitely. Like I utilize... It's traditional, it's traditional it's, astrology. Yeah. I mean, I utilize principles from both together and Me I too. use utilize the lots in a Jyotish context with Vim Shotri Desha because why not, right? There's They're just techniques. That's all. Like, And they're, they, they, they're so... The foundation is the same. That, you know, the foundation is really the same. The Hellenistics treat the nodes the same as the Jodishis, although the Jodishis do a little more with the nodes, but the foundational stuff, the essence, that's the same. The dignities are practically the same. All and also, the same stuff, you know? Yeah, in Parashara, you have the calculations for planetary aspects, which is something you don't have in. In Hellenistic texts, you know, that mathematical preciseness to say. Oh, yeah, but recently, uh, on a side note, uh, yeah. Esan Kazini, who's from Iran. Yeah, Iran. Yeah, yeah, the, the he, Iranian astrologer. Yeah, he would he 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 posted an image about this and then said he was giving a talk on it. There there was a system that these Persian astrologers developed that is like it's like Shadbala, except it's like even even crazier. I didn't think something even crazier than Shadbala could exist, but it's literally like you take all of these different things to assess each planet, like, you know, their essential dignity, accidental dignity, latitude, their, you know, like speed, all of so many things, it's ridiculous. And then you have a ninefold division of like the the most important things get nine points, the second most important get eight. And then down the spectrum and you, 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 it's like 176 things that you look at for each planet yeah. to get a score for each planet. Right. That so, would be, that would be <sighs> Nava Bala. <laughs> oh my, Nava Bala. Yeah, seriously. It's, it's, it's wild. And I, I don't know how it's done or anything. Um, well, I, you know, you know, but, you wow. Know what, what, what <laughs> the psychic, uh, you know what the psychic said, uh, J, J Edgar Casey, right? That's his name. Right? Uh, uh, not no no. You're thinking of J. Edgar Hoover. No no. K uh, Edgar Casey. Edgar, Edgar Casey. No J. Yeah. <laughs> J. Edgar Casey. <laughs> J. Edgar Casey. You know Edgar, Edgar Edgar Casey, right? Edgar. Yeah. Edgar Casey. You know the American psychic said, you know, the most accurate astrology of all is Persian astrology, and I mean. Yeah, I heard this that. This is a side note, but but you know Iran has a lot to offer, and 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 as well oh, as. Oh yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, you know, here we have some mathematical scientific ganita, right? The astronomical uh, part of astrology that has been incredibly useful for modern Jyotishis. It's been incredibly useful for astrologers like uh, Bibi Raman and Ken Rao, who kind of brought in divisional charts in the 20th century. I yeah. mean, this is the type of text that helped Ernst create his system that is, you know... Uh, sure in a way revolutionizing modern Jyotish because we're starting to do Jyotish with tropical zodiac with, with some calculations that he uses. Sure. And, and I mean, uh, this text is responsible for a lot of advances in Jyotish in the 20th century. So in a way, it's a great book, white and black in it, good and bad in it, great and mediocre in it, but in yeah. a way has been a great tool for us, uh, stupid uh, shameful modern astrologers that don't even know how to 
do basic mathematical calculations. Yeah, seriously. Start by hand, and we depend on these apparatuses called computers to do our. We, let me tell you, we are. Uh, what's the word in English? Uh, uh, we are. Um, we are daring. That's uh, we are. Others, we are youth of the nation. <laughs> we we are. We are the youth of the nation. <laughs> we are. We are the youth of a tradition. Yeah. And and we have no idea what we have. I mean, we have these magnificent computers, these magnificent softwares, to you know, uh, tend customers that don't have questions, clients that don't know what to do with their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the irony of of, it's of the funny. situation we're in. But yeah, I don't want to extend this anymore. So okay, cool. You want to say? No, that'll do it. So thanks for watching our introduction to the series on Brihat Parashara Horashastra. And we'll be back with in the next video with uh, chapters one through five, hopefully, assuming we, we can, you know, get through those because there's a lot to talk about. But, uh, you know, otherwise, please hit like, share, and check out um, Fernando's channel. Check out like his website, check out my website. And I'm going to put all these links in the description below. And otherwise guys, like get yourself a copy of this book and, and check it out. If you're, if you're ready to do that, you know? it's free on the internet, by the way, it you is. can just put Brihat Parash, like, like Java and I, a lot of these. We'll put the link and, and, and I'll be oh, sharing, sure. I'll be I sharing the screen yeah. anyway. So yeah, it's, you can get it for free even. So, all right, cool guys. So uh, see you next time.